Okay, let's get started. Okay, so I will start, as I said, with the Bayesian inference basics or inference in general. And so let's say to give to start with a concrete example, let's say you are given your grad student, you're given a data set of two observables. In this case, it's a period, you measure a period and the luminosity. You've given these observables of a bunch of objects in this case stars and you are told fit a line to these data and so we'll work with this example of fitting a line to a bunch of data points and uh, to see how that, that how that happens um, we'll we'll start out generating this data so now let's put ourselves in the shoes of a creator of a universe if you will and we are creating our universe um, and we'll end up with the observer holding these data in our hands. And this is of course up to us how to, how to set this up. And so will our assumption, so we will, we will be this wizard and we will generate some data. And we will assume, we'll make first a bunch of assumptions. We will assume that there is some physical process or perhaps a stochastic process which generates these observational data. And this includes making the, the objects in the universe out there and uh, the process of observing those with our measurement equipment. And so for simulating right now, we, we have full control. We choose a very compli complicated process which with all of its details. But later when we are in the mindset of the observer, we don't know all of this detail. We will try to infer some of this, uh, how this process works. And probabilistic generative model is, um, is this process of generating data, perhaps with some stochastic aspects. And so you can, you can also see it as it's, it's kind of a story. You, it's the story of how the simulated universe and the observational data come about. Okay. And so we will create data from a type of stars, a massive uh, kind of stars called cephids. And cephids uh, are pulsating stars. And you can measure the period of the, these pulsations. And um, they have some sort of abundances, some metallicities, how much chemical elements there are in there. It's not so important what that is for the moment. But what's sort of important is that there's a relationship between the luminosity, the period of their pulsation, and this metallicity. Okay. And we will, because we are creating this universe, we will say the luminosity is related to the period in this way. So it's a, a power law relationship with some coefficients and it depends on the period and it depends on the metallicity with some factors or with some coefficients. And here they are, this is the true value. And here I just wrote this in code and I plot it for you and already it doesn't work because I have to do this, okay. So here's our relation. Um, the stars that are pul pulsating very quickly, they have a low luminosity and the ones that are pulsating slowly have a higher luminosity. And that's our law in our universe. And now we will create a bunch of these uh, objects. So I will draw from a normal distribution, the metallicity, I will draw from a log normal distribution the period, each for 20 objects. And then uh, I use 
this luminosity relation here that I just showed you, I have the period and I will look up what luminosity they are supposed to have. Okay. So if I run this, I generated from a normal distribution of periods, and then I used the luminosity relation to generate their, to assign them luminosities. And the scatter you see here is just because of this metallicity effect, which moves this line a little bit. Okay, um, so what's important right now is we have the properties of these objects but this is something we cannot know directly. We have to do measurements of these properties. So no, now let's see how the observer gets their, their data. So we will add some noise. On top of this true periods, we add some noise and we get our observed period. And it, the same thing for the luminosity, we add some noise and we get our observed luminosity. So if we plot this, here it is. So some of these data points have um, small uncertainties, some have larger uncertainties. And this is, this is then the data set you get as, as, as a student. You, you are told now uh, fit a line to these data and, and infer back this relationship. Okay, and we can uh, draw this also, this whole process that we just described now as, as this kind of illustration. So first we generated the Cephe population. We drew from a log normal distribution, the periods. So we have the width and the where this, this distribution is centered. We generated the periods. The same for the metallicities, we generated those. And then deterministically, we assigned the luminosities. We used a bunch of parameters for that. And then from the periods and the luminosities, we again have a stochastic process, uh, in this case with the normal distribution, which generated our observables. And so you see, you have this whole story of how um, our observations came about, um, sketched out here in a visualization. And now we will turn around and we will stop being the creator of this universe. And we will talk about being an observer. So you, you now end up with these data in your hand. And um, what is our motivation now? So if we knew the period luminosity relationship, then you can do interesting things with this. Because if you know the period, sorry, if you if you measure the period, you can then infer the luminosity. And if you know the intrinsic luminosity of an object, and you your instrument, your telescope measures the flux of this object, you can infer from how bright it's supposed to be and how right you see it, how far away it is. So you can measure the distance of these objects. And this is a, a, a predictiveness. This distance indication is a very useful tool. And then you can do cosmology with this kind of, with this kind of objects. And Francesca will elaborate on this a bit more next week. But also you might be interested in this period luminosity relationship because you want to learn something about how this comes about, how the interior of stars work. So if you compare your data to various models of how the interior of stars work, you might learn some insights about the physical processes that go, out, go on in these objects. And so we want to infer at the moment, we want to infer this period luminosity relationship. We want to fit this line. But it's, um, it's difficult to do this because we don't have all the information that we use to generate as a creator um, 
all, all of these, these uh, details of this process. We don't know all of these. So for example, um, one source of this uncertainty, something that we lack information about, is that we don't know the, the entire true process that's going out on in the universe. So for example, we might not be aware that the metallicity, um, we didn't measure with our telescopes, the metallicity in this case, we didn't know, we might not know that this influences our relationship. So we're missing part of the generative model. And this you can call systematic uncertainty or epistemic uncertainty that you, you're not aware of the entire or you're not modeling the right process, apologies. And then there's a second type of uncertainty, which is that we have a limited data set. We, our instrument doesn't measure the periods perfectly and the luminosities perfectly. We only have 20 objects, not a million. And so we have some statistical process that introduces statistical uncertainty or alearic uncertainty from alea, the Latin for dice. So we, we have some um, uncertainty because our data are slightly random. Okay, so how do we address these, these issues? So the second issue, the, the statistical uncertainty that the, that the data have some probabilistic aspects to it, we can address by quantifying this uncertainty. So we assume a probabilistic generative model and we estimate its parameters. We, we infer with probability theory what could be the probable parameters without trying to find just one of these parameters. And we try to address the first part that we don't know the true model by evaluating the models and criticizing them either in isolation, so that's model criticism, or we might have, uh, for example, you can do this with, with visualization or with tests, and Francesca will go into details in the next week, or you can compare models um, for how well they explain the data, for example, and then you can compare these models. So at the moment, we will primarily try to estimate the parameters of this relationship. And we will make a bunch of assumptions on how, to, how we go about it. But I will um, pause here for a little bit and wait to see if you have any questions up to this point or anything I should repeat or wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, clear. And I will give you the chance to ask some questions right now. You can either just unmute or put your question in the chat. Misha, yes. Hey, Johannes, I, I just said that you didn't say much about alpha and beta. You can maybe clarify that. Ah, yes, yes, I should say that. <clears throat> yeah, I think I have a bit of more explanation uh, below, but so the these coefficients here, so gamma is related to the metallicity but alpha and beta have some specific meaning. Um, so alpha sort of sets the luminosity you would have if the period is 10 days, then this would be zero. And then so alpha sets the luminosity for a period of 10 days. And then beta is the parameter that controls the slope. So if the period increases, how much the luminosity increases and you see it's negative. Oh, sorry. Um, no, 
And um, yes, so it's it's the coefficient that relates to the period. That's what I wanted to say here. But the, uh, I, I was uh, I wanted to uh, clarify that why we have these parameters at all. I mean, why it's not numbers? Why do we, you know, place letters for them? They are fixed so far, right? I mean, we don't. Yes. <clears throat> right. So. In the first situation, we are the creators of this universe and we, we know the true value, right? We, we have a specific value um, and we can set it. Uh, but then now we change perspective and we are the observers. And now we try to infer uh, this relationship and we don't know we, we, we lack information about <clears throat> these parameters and we might not even know the entire model. And so we don't know these alpha and beta values and we actually try to infer them. <clears throat> so this is um, what I'm getting to here. So now we are the observer and we assume because we have limited knowledge we assume that we want to learn this period luminosity relationship and we assume it has this shape. And you see, it's a simplification of the entire model. We are lacking here some terms. So we are approximating the true process and we don't know the alpha and the beta values in this state or from this perspective. Does it make sense, Misha? Thanks. Yeah, that clarifies uh, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, so we also know from our sample that we have uncertain Gaussian measurements of the luminosity and of the period. And so these are our assumptions. And we know a bunch of things about our measurement process. So we know, for example, how much uncertainty it adds um, in, in our measurement. And what do we want to know? We want to know these two parameters primarily. So we want to know alpha, that's the luminosity for uh, a cephate with a period of 10 days. And we know, want to know beta, that's the parameter that relates the luminosity and the period, how strong this relationship is. But now we have to think about what does it really know, what, what, sorry, what does it really mean to know or to constrain these parameters? What, what, do, we, what do we mean when we say we want to put num numbers to those parameters? What does it mean to know these parameters? What does it mean to constrain these parameters? Okay. So um, we will assume that there is a true value out there in the universe, but we will probably never be able to measure it perfectly with infinite precision just because of our limitations. But instead you can talk about whether that true value is within some interval or it's outside that interval, okay? So you could say alpha is between one and two, and or it's certainly not between one and two. And with probability theory, you can extend this to say, okay, it's within an interval of one, between one and two with some probability. So with 99% probability is within that interval. And the extension of that further is to write, to describe parameter probability distribution. So what's the, what's the probability for that parameter to be um, some certain value? So you might have, have a distribution over that parameter. And so we use um, probability distributions of these parameters to describe our current state of information. So you might know it's within 
some range and you'd write a probability distribution to describe that state of information. Now, this approach does not imply that the value itself has a distribution. So we still think there's a one true value out there. And if you create um, several instances, if you will, of these universes, we don't say that you can create this bunch of universes and they would follow that probability distribution. We just talk about the state of information on the true value. So this is some uh, epistemology for you, but uh, you can ignore that as well if you like. So more to the practical aspects. So if we have some data, our data set D, we would like some method which produces a probability distribution for us, a probability distribution over alpha that we can say, okay, within 99% probability, it's within that interval. But, uh, okay, and you can write this as um, uh, in, in, this, in this way, um, saying you want a probability on alpha, you want this probability distribution on alpha, and you write it with this vertical dash, given the data D, so this is just read as the probability of alpha given D, probability of alpha given D. Um, so you have your data and given this, what's your probability distribution on alpha? That's called a conditional probability distribution. It's just a way of writing um, what I wrote here. And we also know that probability distributions are normalized. So if you integrate, over the parameter, you should get one. Okay, unfortunately, there's no method that can produce this probability of alpha given D just using your data. But, um, but what you can do and what we already did is if you knew alpha, you can produce data sets. This is what we do, did initially. We set the parameter. We, we said, if we know alpha and beta and all the other things, then we can generate a bunch of data. So we can, at the moment, we can talk about how frequently some data set D is produced if we have been given alpha and beta and whatever. So we have pro the probability of producing some data the given some values alpha. So we can describe the distributions of data that are possible given some, some values. Okay, and this is also probability distribution, but not over alpha, but over all possible data. And if the data are continuous, then you can also write them as, as such. And now we have the situation that we want um, probability of alpha given the data. This is what we want. But what we actually have is a process of generating data or, or the distribution of data if we have already a knowledge of alpha. So how do we solve this? How do we go from this thing to that thing. And uh, here I will just introduce Bayes' theorem. Um, and it starts out relatively simple. So if you have a Venn diagram, you have some uh, set A and some set B. You can talk about this intersection where both A and B um, have area. And you can write this as this, this part. You can write as um, the part of A that is also in B. Or you can write it as the part of B that also happens to be in A. And we can also write um, talk about this in probability theory. So if you have some event A, for example, it rains, or you have some event B, 
um, I don't know, it's Wednesday, then you can talk about the probability of it being of, of event A occurring, the probability of event B occurring, and you can talk about this intersection of both by either you start with A, the probability of A, and uh, the probability of B given A, so only the part of B um, that is already in A. So you start with A and you look what part of it is B, or you come from the other side, you have the probability of B, probability of B, and then you ask what part of B is in A, probability of A given that you're already in B. And these two are equal. And so, and you see that one has B given A and one has A given B. So exactly what we have above and they are equal. So if you flip around a little bit and um, so here it's just written probability of A given B, probability of A, and here's the flipped version. That's just the law of conditional probabilities. If we translate this to our problem, we have, and we move one term over, we have the probability of alpha, which is what we're interested in, equals the probability of the data given alpha. So this is what we know already. And then we have a, uh, some additional terms here. That's some probability of alpha that we have to understand. And we have the probability of the data. This we also have to understand. And now I will spend some time to explain these terms to you. <clears throat> and they all have specific names and they're all quite important. So um, let's start easy on the left. We have what is called the posterior probability distribution. This is the information we want. We want a probability distribution of alpha ingesting our knowledge of the data. Okay, so that's good. And then here on the top, we have what we already talked about, what is in general called the sampling distribution or uh, we will refer to it also as the likelihood function. This is how probable it is to generate a specific data set given alpha. And so this encodes our probabilistic process. It's a function of alpha, so we have to give it some alpha. It's not a probability distribution of alpha but it helps us update this thing. So what is this? So here we have another probability distribution over alpha, and this is called the prior probability distribution topology. So here we have on the left, an object that's a probability distribution of alpha. And on the right, we also have to have an object that's a probability distribution over alpha. And this is our starting point, our initial state of information before we take the data. And this is sort of always a bit of a mystery to initial uh, users of base, uh, Bayesian inference but it's just a, a starting point, your, your state of information that is being updated by this uh, likelihood. And what do you use here? What can you use here? So you might, you, in almost all cases, you have some information. And um, if you don't, you could use a uninformative, distribution that maximizes your or, or maximizes the entropy or in other words you you're maximally ignorant about what alpha could be so for example very wide flat uh, uniform distribution and there are mathematical theories about how to produce such probability distributions for different uh, problems or 
you might have done a previous experiment that wasn't very good, but already gave you some information on alpha. And then you can use that as your informed state of information. Or you might be a theoretician and, and have developed a model about how uh, this luminosity period relationship works. And you might know what is physically reasonable or you might know from similar models what uh, parameter values are, are reasonable. And so you might have an informed state of prior information and you can encode this here as a probability distribution. So that's the prior. That's our initial probability distribution that we are updating. And what's this down here? So remember that on the left, it has to be a probability distribution over alpha, which has to be normalized. And so what's on the right here is just this normalizing constant. Um, so if you integrate everything on the right, it has to integrate to one. So we can just write it like this, the probability of the data is this integration over what's on the top or over the posterior, or you can write it also on the, sorry, this is, uh, yeah. Um, I think this part is not entirely correct, but you can write it as something that normalizes what's on top of the equation here. Something that normalizes this if you integrate it from infinite bounds. So you have um, essentially what you're doing here is you're averaging the likelihood with a weight, with this integration process being weighted towards your prior. And this uh, thing, this normalizing constant is called the Bayesian evidence or it's also called the marginal likelihood And so we have Bayes' theorem, we have all of its components. And now we're gonna think how to use these in practice. But I will also give you a chance now to ask questions and um, yeah, just state what you found unclear and what you would like me to go over again. Okay, so let's see how we can use this Bayesian inference in practice. And we're gonna use uh, grids because it's computationally simple and it lets us ignore all of these sampling algorithms for the moment. Um, so let's uh, first start with a uniform prior probability distribution on alpha. So we say, okay, we. We think alpha is certainly not larger than zero and certainly not smaller than minus 10. But between this, between these bounds, we don't know what the value is. And we say it's equally probable between those for some reason. And so we start out with this probability distribution to be flat in these bounds and zero otherwise. Here's a neat notation to write this. So we can also say alpha is distributed according to our prior. It's distributed uniformly between minus 10 and zero. So the tilde here means is distributed as. And so we, we will just use a grid here. Um, I will generate a grid between minus 10 and zero with a whole lot, number of points. Uh, this is the midpoint, and this is how wide the grid points are apart. And let me just show you every tenth point here. This is our grid. 
now we can compute our prior density, <clears throat> which is um, one over the width of these, these grid uh, points. And here we have our prior then. And uh, so the density is one over the width of the entire prior. This is the one over 10. So this is the starting point, this is minus 10 and this is zero. So we have one over 10, that's our prior density. But if we want to know with, with, within a space of our grid, because our grid is finite, um, how much probability density there is between one grid point and the next. So the integral between two grid points, we have to multiply by the width. And that's then our prior at that location. And here it is in blue, that's our prior probability distribution, flat distribution between minus 10 and zero. <clears throat> okay. But, so now we use the flat distribution on alpha because we thought, okay, we are, we are ignorant on alpha. But um, you might reformulate your model to not depend on alpha, but on some transformation of alpha. You can always do that. You just change the formula. So we call our formula is this one, right? You can also write some exponential of theta here instead of alpha. So in, in that case, you might want to work on the theta that's then a transformed uh, function. But how do you know that you want to do a flat prior on this exponential dependent thing or you want to do it a flat prior on this alpha thing. So let's see what happens if we put a flat prior on log of minus alpha. So um, minus alpha, I remind you, goes from um, zero to, sorry. So in this case, we, we will make a, a linear spacing, the uniform sampling from minus one to plus one. And then we will transform with minus and the tenth power. And now we made a uniform spacing in this, in this logarithmic transformation. So we use the flat prior on this log minus alpha. And what happens if we do that? Well, you get in alpha, you get this distribution, which is not flat. And the lesson here is there's not really an objectively uniform prior. It depends on how you parameterize this, how you parameterize your model. In other words, you can also reparameterize your model to make the the prior flat. So the prior sort of encodes something about how your probability is distributed, but there's no unique um, dis probability distribution that you can assign to it. That's just a subtlety that you should be aware of. Okay. <clears throat> now we talked a bunch about the prior. And please chime in if you have questions. So we talked a bunch about the prior. Now let's think about this uh, sampling distribution. How do we generate data given alpha? Okay. So our likelihood function. So in this case, we assume we have an alpha value and we have 
we have already some data D. And so we need a function that computes how probable it is to generate this data D. And for that, we specify a model again. And here is a simplified version of the true model, um, which is we, we assume we know the period because we, oh, sorry, we, we measured our period and our luminosities with the normal distribution. And we have some intrinsic values that we don't know. These generate our observables and the period informs the luminosity. The luminosity is deterministically set by the period with some coefficients, alpha and beta, that we don't know. Okay, so here it is. Um, this is the, sorry, this is the luminosity. The luminosity um, depends on the period with this alpha and beta coefficients. So we can compute um, the luminosity as a function of the period on alpha and beta. And for the moment, we will just as assume beta to be minus three to make the problem simple and one dimensional. And that corresponds to setting a, a Dirac delta function prior on beta. And later we will relax this, but just for computational simplicity, I will just, just work with alpha. Okay, so this luminosity relation allows us to predict the luminosity given a period. But we only have a measured period and a measured luminosity. So we cannot use this directly. But for now, I will just ignore the, the small uncertainties on the period. So we call from the data the Uncertainties on the period is, is um, plotted here, but it's so small that you cannot see it. So we will ignore the uncertainty on the period and just be concerned with the uncertainties on the luminosity. You can extend this later, but let's just do the simplification from that. Okay, so if we ignore these small period uncertainties, we can write for the observed luminosity. So here we have the observed luminosity. We say it's normal distributed around the true value of the luminosity expected if we feed in the observed period, the alpha and the beta. So we put in the observed period, we put in what we think are beta and alpha, we get a luminosity that our model predicts, and then we compare this to the observation with this normal distribution and our measurement uncertainty. Okay, so we know this on the left, we know the periods, we know alpha and beta because we're assuming it, and we know sigma. So for one data point, for one data point, and given alpha and beta, we can write it also like this, the probability of these data given alpha, is the Gaussian probability distribution. Um, and here it is spelled out. We are comparing the observed luminosity to the predicted one at that period. So we just look it up on the line that's set by alpha and beta. That's uh, the Gaussian um, probability density function, PDF. And that gives us the the likelihood for a single data point, probability of the data given alpha. But we want to use all the data points together. So we want to do a logical and, the model has to hold for all of these data points. And the logical and in probability theory is a multiplication of the probabilities. So we multiply this thing across all our data points. And finally, we have our likelihood, which is the probability of the data given alpha. Now you can look at this. And if you have the product of a bunch of these, you can do a magic trick, mathematical uh, thing, which is we, we take the logarithm of this 
and we multiply by minus two. And we're also gonna drop a bunch of constants. For example, this term here is a constant for us. And if we take the logarithm, we just get this. And so we can write the product in logarithm as a sum of the difference between this line prediction in our case and our measurement over two sigma. And this is what many people know as chi-square. But what it really is, is just minus two times the log likelihood of a Gaussian observation model. And if you had something else, if you didn't want to assume a Gaussian, apologies, if you didn't want to assume a Gaussian, you would go through this process and get a different formula. But because we use Gaussian statistics right now, we, we obtain this likelihood. And now we can uh, program this. We make a function that computes the logarithm of, of this likelihood. We give it alpha and, and beta. At the moment, we're assuming beta to be minus three. We use our luminosity model to predict um, using the observed periods, alpha and beta, these are our coefficients. We use it to predict the expected luminosity for each object. And then we compute our chi-square sum here observed luminosities minus expected luminosities over the uncertainties squared and sum it up. And remember the chi-square is related with a factor of minus two. So we return uh, minus chi-square half. And now we have a function in our programming environment that encodes this likelihood. We have encoded now the likelihood and the prior now we can do Bayesian inference. We can also, um, instead of evaluating the probability of some data, we can generate some data given alpha. This is what we did before, but here's another version of this. We have alpha and beta. We, um, we generate some, uh, some experimental noise. We compute for each observed period, again, the true luminosity or the expected luminosity, that's the same as above here. We add our experimental noise and we get a different realization of, of um, this data set, so a different measurement of the luminosity. Okay, so let's use those two in combination. So I will take the grid I have on alpha. So I will step through a bunch of alphas, not all of them because there are too many, but I will step through a bunch of them from minus 10 to zero, and we will generate a bunch of data given that alpha, okay? And uh, I will also plot our actual observations. And here it is. So if we set alpha to this value, I think it corresponds to these data points. And if we set alpha to minus 10, then it corresponds to this data point. And our actual data that we received uh, were these black ones. And this is called a prior predictive check. You, you, you will generate a bunch of samples from your prior. In this case, we used a uniform grid and you generate a bunch of data and you look, well, do they look sort of reasonable? Not necessarily comparing to the data at the moment, but for example, would this blow up our detector or would this never be detected? Um, then we probably don't want to use such a prior. Okay, so this was prior predictive checks. Now let's plot our likelihood function. So we have our log likelihood as a function of alpha. We step through them and we plot 
the likelihood how frequently it would generate data given this alpha. And here it is. And note the logarithmic units here. Um, so they, they span many orders of magnitude here. And you see that somewhere around here at these values, um, our model tends to produce more frequently data like the one we've seen than some values like here. That's what the likelihood function does. So the mo model most frequently makes data, sorry, the model most frequently making the data that look closest to our observed sample is somewhere around minus four. Okay, but now we want a probability distribution. This is not a probability distribution. This is a function of alpha. This doesn't tell us how we integrate over alpha. For that, we need a probability distribution and we have one, it's the prior. So let's do it. We uh, first compute the top of the base um, theorem by multiplying the likelihoods um, with, the, with the prior. And uh, for that, so at the moment we're using a flat prior. So I just need to uh, take the exponential of the log likelihood. And I'm subtracting here the highest value to avoid going um, below the range that um, can be represented on a computer. It's 10 to the 300 to 10 to the minus 300 approximately. So I get a unnormalized posterior by exponentiating the log likelihood with a flat prior. And then I compute, and you can do this also in logarithmic units, uh, just the same equation, but just taking the log here. And then we compute this normalizing factor. So we take the sum over our grid because that's our integration. And if we want it in log, we take the log of that and we add back in this constant that we subtracted here for numerical reasons, okay? Now we check that our posterior is really uh, normalized. So we, we, uh, we take this unnormalized one, we divide it by the evidence. So in, in logarithmic units, that's a subtraction. And then we take the exponential and that's our posterior. And here we check whether that posterior sums to one and indeed it does. Let's plot it. Here it is. Um, I plot the probability distribution of alpha once for the prior that was flat and once for the posterior that's in blue. Now we have a posterior probability distribution. You can also measure um, the information gain. So how much information you, you gain from going from this prior probability distribution to this posterior by this equation, but we can come back to that. Now you have a probability distribution. You can also um, make a cumulative. So you sum up what is left of this, uh, left of any uh, value of alpha. This is the cumulative. And then you can read off, well, uh, some range which contains 99% of your probability. And we can also generate a bunch of data. Uh, sorry, we can, we can pick out weighted by this probability distribution and see what the, the data we would generate would look like. So let's try this. We step through all the alphas and we wait it. We wait um, our, our model by how probable it is. And if we do that, then we have our model prediction from our posterior. And that's the posterior prediction. And that looks nice. It goes through our data points. And it, it's also notably 
much more narrow than what we started out with these prior predictions. Okay, um, so we learned a lot and we can quantify how much we learned with this information gain formula. And you can read up more about it here, <clears throat> but essentially it, it uh, integrates the ratio of the prior, the gray here, to the blue one, which is the posterior. It integrates that and it gives a value um, in, in units of bits. So how many bits of information we gained from the data on this parameter. Okay, I spoke long enough, more than long enough, I think. So um, we will go to breakout rooms now. <clears throat> and um, first I will uh, ask for if you have any questions at this point, but um, um, after that we will go into breakout rooms and you should discuss with your colleagues um, these, these questions. <clears throat> and um, um, when you go into the breakout rooms, um, please remember to be active. Um, just when you enter, say, hi, I am Johannes. I will be active in this room and so that you get to know each other a little bit and that it's uh, a bit more interactive. And you're also encouraged um, to turn on your cameras. And uh, yeah, just uh, please contribute. Okay, so I will stop here. If you have any questions, please, please unmute or just put your question in the chat. While we wait for people, Johannes, can you quickly summarize what uh, will follow like <laughs> after the breakup room uh, we, we finish with today's uh, lecture is it right yes so um after the breakout room um you we can come back to your lecture and then you show a little bit more yes um so okay good there will probably be not that much time left before 12 and so we will um continue on this notebook uh, at at two um yes but we will after the breakout room we, we come back to to this common room good okay um, i will close there are there questions about this material there is one in the chat have a look okay so David. Okay. David had a question. In the equation of the log posterior, when dropping constant factors, why was the factor of two kept in the equation? So I'm guessing you are referring to here? Yes, I'm referring to that, yes. Yes. Um, I think that's just a mistake on my side. Very good. I will put you down for five points. But wait, um, you refer now to the factor of two in the denominator. It could have been a fraction, one half in front of the uh, squared. Because I see it in the equation below as well, the uh, definition of the log likelihood. Yeah, so um, here we had this half in there, right? And if we take minus two times the log, then we should not keep it. No, but wait, um, there is also a typo in this equation which you are pointing. So one half should be outside of the uh, square. That's correct. It should be one half of the fraction. <laughs> Very good. You... And then, David, question is what, what, what um, was about that precisely? Uh, is there any significance to keeping that or um, 
I guess it doesn't really matter, right? It doesn't really matter exactly. Yeah. yeah. You know what? Because we anyway, I mean, that's what what normalization is for. Right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, it does matter because this factor, um, it's a factor in log space, right? And the normalizing constant is in linear space. So it, in linear space, this sort of flattens your, uh, your function, right? It's basically a square root in linear space, just like here. Wait, wait. You normalize log function or uh, um, exponentiate, exponentiated function? So what I was trying to say is you can also write it as if this comes out right. So you have this one and then exponentiate this one. Okay, this is still being a bit wrong about the brackets, but if you imagine this being squared and then you take the exponential and then you have minus a half here, that should be the same as this here. Because in the exponential, you would multiply this onto here. Right? So it would be the same as this. But the normalizing constant we were talking about above, this one, Right, mm -hmm. it's normalizing the probabilities, not the log probabilities. So we are integrating over the probabilities over this likelihood function. So if we drop, drop any multiplicative factors here, that would catch it. But uh, this is not a multiplicative factor. This is an exponential. Uh, this is an exponent. I'm not sure if that was your confusion, but I think that's that answers the question. Okay. Are there more questions? Uh, yeah, I have one. Mm -hmm. um, can you just go back to the kind of last thing we talked about, where you have so the final result with the red error bar region? Yep. Okay, so maybe you sort of mentioned this, and I just didn't quite understand, but I noticed that we don't exactly recover, especially at the lower end, Sorry. that truth value that we like used for the um, when we were creating our universe. We don't actually get a slope of negative four point four, and then when you look at like, the cumulative probability distribution, negative four point four really looks like it's ruled out, even though that was our mm -hmm. that was the alpha we used in our universe. So I'm just mm -hmm. a little curious if that is sort of a result of like not doing enough iterations of this or not having uh, a broad enough parameter space or something to have to do with our prior um, or if it just happens that way sometimes that you can't exactly recover your true input values just given the scatter and the air burrs. Right. Do, do you recall right now what the uh, uh, alpha we assumed was? I think it was minus 4.4. Four. Minus 4.4. 4. So your Yeah, your that's internet, that's why I was curious. Yeah. Right. So it's it's slightly out or it is outside this the bulk of this posterior probability distribution. And uh, what did we assume about beta? Do you recall? Uh, can you scroll up? Your yeah, I'm scrolling up right now. Um, oh, we had it at minus 2.8 was the value used in our simulated universe. Right, so we simulated with minus 2.8 and mm -hmm. 
what we what did we assume in this analysis? Oh yeah, we used minus two, didn't we? Or three? Or minus I three. Can't remember. Yes. Okay. So we we one of our assumptions is basically wrong. And that's why we get, if you will, we get a bias here. Okay. We're, we're slightly off because of that. I think it's the relation between those two. Is it points. intentional, Johannes? It is intentional because it, it shows you what we talked about a bit earlier, that you have this, okay, we, we took care of the statistical uncertainty with um, parameter estimation by treating these probability distributions, but you're left with, you, you, we didn't model all of it. We just assumed something very specific and we, we, we have some systematic uncertainty. We're slightly off because of that. So it's a limitation of our current model working in one dimension. And later on in the lecture, I want to extend to also having beta free. And we'll see then if that, uh, if that improves it. Okay, thank you. Good. I also put you down for five points. Anyone else? Okay, then um, I will open the breakout rooms and you discuss among yourselves and with the tutor um, the, these, these questions. Uh, let me see if I can manage to do that. Stop sharing real quick. <laughs>